The way that these drugs work is that they inhibit a specific type of enzyme called cyclooxygenase enzyme. There's two types. There's actually more than two, but we're only going to focus on two. Cyclooxygenase 1, known as COX-1, cyclooxygenase 2, known as COX-2. What these enzymes do is they produce a chemical or a group of chemicals called prostaglandins. Now, prostaglandins, they're everywhere in the body, right? And they do a whole bunch of things. But some really important functions that are really, really important for you to understand when it comes to these drugs are outlined here on my Venn diagram. So, for example, cyclooxygenase 1 enzyme will produce prostaglandins that play a really important role in creating mucus in your stomach. Now, why do we create mucus in the stomach? It's there to protect the stomach from the acid that's being produced to stop it from digesting that stomach. So that's really important. That's what these prostaglandins do produced by COX-1. The prostaglandins also help produce bicarbonate in the stomach. Now, what's bicarbonate? Bicarbonate is a chemical HCO3 negative. Why is that important? Well, it's important because when HCO3 negative comes across acid, which is simply just H+, they bind together and what they produce is H2CO3, known as carbonic acid. What carbonic acid does is it splits itself apart and produces water, and carbon dioxide. So effectively, when bicarbonate produced by these prostaglandins comes across with acid in the stomach, it neutralizes it into water and carbon dioxide. So both the prostaglandins produced by COX-1 help protect the stomach by making mucus and bicarbonate. Now in addition to that, COX-1 enzyme is really important in activating platelets. This means COX-1 plays an important role in blood clotting. So remember that. Now COX-2 plays an important role when it comes to inhibiting platelets. So this stops clotting. So remember that, COX-2 stops clotting, COX-1 activates clotting. All right, now, there's a lot of overlap between COX-1 enzymes, COX-2 enzymes in regards to the prostaglandins they produce and their respective functions. So what both COX-1 and COX-2 are really good at doing is producing prostaglandins that play a role in renal perfusion. Renal is your kidneys, perfusion is the blood getting to the kidneys that can participate in gas exchange and also when it comes to the kidneys be filtered. So for example you all know that when you look into your kidneys each kidney has one million units called nephrons. Nephrons are what filter our blood. That's one of the primary roles of our kidneys to filter the blood. So as the blood vessel is coming into the kidney it turns into what looks like a ball of yarn which we call the glomerulus, which is actually Latin for ball of yarn. Blood vessel comes in, blood vessel comes out. That's called the afferent arteriole. This is called the efferent arteriole. And at the ball of yarn, we've actually got a capsule that looks like this, looks like a little Pac-Man. And this capsule is part of the nephron. It's called the renal capsule or the glomerular capsule. This is where the blood gets filtered in the kidneys. Okay, now this is an important point. Of the blood that's going past, we need to filter 120 milliliters per minute. This is what we term our glomerular filtration rate. We don't want it to go too high, we don't want it to go too low. One of the ways that we control this glomerular filtration rate is through prostaglandins produced by both COX-1 and COX-2. What these prostaglandins do is they dilate the afferent arteriole, meaning it allows for more blood to come through to maintain 120 mils per minute. That's what's so important. COX-1, COX-2. Another thing is, these prostaglandins produced by both COX-1, COX-2 are important to produce pain because prostaglandins, what they do is they go to pain receptors called nociceptors and they lower their threshold. They make it easier for them to send a painful stimulus. They also go to the hypothalamus which controls our uh, heat cycles. It's basically the thermostat of the body. Hypothalamus knows it needs to be about 37 degrees, but prostaglandins play around with that and it makes it think that it needs to set the thermostat higher, 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 higher and develop a fever. And prostaglandins play a really important role in inflammation. So this is vasodilation, which we see here, right? Vasodilation and capillary permeability. These two things lead to the cardinal signs of inflammation, pain, fever, redness, swelling. Uh, so pain, uh, heat, redness, swelling. All right, so now that we know what they do, we need to talk about the drugs that we use to stop these prostaglandins. So effectively, aspirin, ibuprofen, celecoxib, voltaren, they all play a role in stopping prostaglandins, stopping these effects. Now what I've done is I've highlighted where these particular drugs sit in regards to whether they're COX-1 specific, 
COX-2 specific or non-specific. So let's have a look. Let's first start with COX-1. Aspirin is a COX-1 specific drug and what it does is it stops COX-1. So if you take aspirin, it's stopping gut mucus production, it's stopping gut bicarbonate production. These two things which protect the stomach are no longer there, which means the acid that's being produced can now irritate the stomach and result in gastrointestinal upset. This is the major adverse effect of taking aspirin, is GIT upset and GIT bleeding. In actual fact, what the found is of 100,000 people taking NSAIDs, 300 of those die of gastrointestinal related disease and often it's due to GI bleeding. All right? This is one of the reasons why they tell you if you're taking these medications, these NSAIDs, take it with food to help soften the blow of the drug on the stomach. All right? So that's aspirin. But the other thing is, you can see that aspirin inhibits platelet activation, which means aspirin inhibits clotting. This is one of the reasons why people who have cardiovascular issues, maybe increased likelihood of stroke or heart attack, have been told to take small amounts of aspirin to stop the clotting. So aspirin can be cardioprotective in certain quantities. All right. All right. So let's move over. We're going to have a look at the majority of the NSAIDs actually inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2, the term non-selective. So naproxen, for example. Naproxen inhibits both COX-1 and COX-2 at lower doses, so a bit less than over-the-counter doses, it's more so a COX-1 inhibitor, but that's why they're so effective at relieving pain, relieving fever, relieving inflammation. But the problem is they also alter renal perfusion. If they inhibit the prostaglandins that dilate the afferent arteriole, this can result in constriction of the afferent arteriole and drop down the glomerular filtration rate. If this drops down, you're not filtering enough of the stuff out of your blood. This can result in acute renal disease. This is not a good thing, okay? So this is when these types of drugs are taken too often or abused. Ibuprofen is another, has the same effects, renal perfusion, uh, inhibiting renal perfusion, pain, fever, inflammation. So really good at pain, fever, inflammation. Now, have a look, I've got inflammation here. Now, while aspirin is going to affect pain, fever, and inflammation, inflammation sits more over with a COX-2 enzyme function, which means aspirin is good at pain and fever, not that great at inflammation. If you were to take a dose of ibuprofen that helps you get rid of osteoarthritis uh, inflammation over three days, you'd have to take around about four grams of aspirin, which is toxic, all right? So you need way more aspirin compared to ibuprofen just to have the same anti-inflammatory effects is what I'm saying. And then uh, uh, diclofenac is basically Voltaren. And as you can see, inhibits both COX-1, COX-2, however, pushes more over to the COX-2 role, which means, as we look at COX-2, if you take a COX-2 inhibiting drug, what it's gonna do is it inhibits platelet inhibition. You're inhibiting inhibition, so it leads to platelet activation, leads to clotting. So what we find is that the COX-2 inhibiting enzymes, like uh, uh, diclofenac, so Voltaren, and Celecoxib, have some points been associated with increase, increased platelet aggregation, so coagulation, clotting. However, celecoxib has now been shown to not significantly affect this, which is great because all the previous COX-2 specific drugs resulted in an increased likelihood of stroke and cardiovascular effects like a heart attack because they increased clotting, all right? Celecoxib seems to not significantly have this effect, which is great. Uh, Voltaren may have a slight increased clotting effect, all right? So the other thing is that because celecoxib is COX-2 specific, it doesn't have the gut problem. So this is why aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen, Voltaren have been told to take these on a full stomach and celecoxib, they still say it because it's a COX inhibitor, but it's a lot more gentle on the stomach than the other drugs, okay? so.